Good afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch. And uh, we are now looking forward to sharing with you our perspectives on geopolitics and global trade. What can be done today? And we wanted to share with you uh, what we believe is uh, an interesting corporate perspective on where global trade will go. Uh, I'm being joined by a illustrious panel, which I will introduce in a few minutes. And I'd like to kick us off with just uh, three, four slides on how we see the world evolving. <coughs> Introducing myself, my name is Nikolaus Lang. I'm a senior partner at uh, BCG, the Boston Consulting Group. I'm leading BCG's global advantage practice, uh, which is dedicated to geopolitics and trade and international collaboration. So when you advise corporate leaders, what is one of the most striking changes I have observed in the last five years is that the way how corporate leaders think about their business is moving away from a monodimensional perspective of the future to a multidimensional perspective to the of the future. And that means that corporate leaders ask us about what are the scenarios of the future? How does the world in 2030 look like? And so, based on this, we have uh, developed a few scenarios which we believe could describe the future. The first scenario is a scenario which is called back to the future. The scenario back to the future is a scenario which is kind of reimagining the world we knew from 1990s, 2000, a world geared towards free trade, a world where the Bretton Woods system and institutions were working, still working, and companies that were actually seeing the world as relatively flat. Remember, it's the time when Francis Fukuyama was speaking about the end of history. The second scenario is what we would call the limited stalemate, which is a continuation of the conflict in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine, and we have Minister Kuleba speaking to us later in the afternoon. And of course, there's a view of saying, given the static front line, given major elections in Russia, Ukraine, and US next year, this war is not likely to end very soon. Then there's a third scenario, which is called multipolar competition. A scenario where we see an increasing emergence of three groups, and I'm not saying blocks, deliberately I'm not saying blocks. First, a Western group with US, EU, and some of allies in the Indo-Pacific. Second, an Eastern bloc and group between China and Russia, and some allied countries ranging from North Korea to Belarus, and then a third group of countries which is not recreating the movement of the non-alliance, but which shows that they want to be at equidistance between these two groups, and this is of course first and foremost India, Indonesia, but also countries in this region and in Africa. And then there's a fourth scenario which a lot of corporate leaders always ask us about, which is actually the global escalation. And I think we discussed about this potential of a global escalation just before lunch. And of course, that would be the addition of a war in the Indo-Pacific to the current conflicts we see around the world. So these are four scenarios. Now, the beauty with scenarios is that they are precisely wrong, but generally right. Now, when we look at the scenarios going forward, the key question is, where do we see the future and what is the most likely scenario? Going through these four scenarios, we definitely see a loss of steam when it comes to the back to the future scenarios. Look at the CHIPS Act, look at IRA, look at the challenges we heard also this morning around WTO. So having a world in 2030 that is similar to what we had around the 1990s and 2000s, is, at least from our perspective, relatively unlikely. Second, the limited stalemate. 
We have seen movements in the last 12 months as with increased Western aids in Ukraine, all those stalled now. President Zelensky several times in the US and a clear focus on continuing this war. However, we are in a war of attrition. Did you know that last year we had tens of thousands of kilometers won from both sides? Well, if you accumulate the movement of the armies in the last nine months, no side has won more than 1,000 square kilometers. So de facto, we have a static front line. Probably this war will at least continue for the next 12 to 18 months if you look at the elections that stand before us. Ukraine, Russia, US. So this is something that will definitely impact us for the next years to come, although hopefully we will reach some kind of ceasefire negotiations in the next years to come. So the dominant scenario is the scenario of the multipolar world. And when you look at what has happened in the last 12 months, a lot of signals go in this direction. It's a multipolar world where we have President Xi traveling to Moscow in March, President Putin traveling to um, Beijing last month. We have the emergence of the BRICS and the expansion of the BRICS. We have a strong development around the world of an independent thinking beyond the two blocks we are looking at. And last but not least, in this multipolar world, we have also seen the emergence of old conflicts in the last few weeks. nagorno karabakh Armenia-Azerbaijan, Kosovo-Serbia, and of course, Israel-Gaza. So all these developments show that the multipolar world is probably the highly scenario for 2030. On global escalation, we are a little bit more cautious because we believe that global escalation at this stage, given economic development, military unreadiness, is less likely to happen. So what does this mean for business? Well, I come with a half positive news. When you look at the left-hand side of this chart, you see the development of global trade in the next 10 years. The good news is that global trade will grow by 2.3% per year. You tell me, well, that's actually not bad. Well, under the scenario back to the future, between 1990 and 2010, trade was growing 7% per year. So we are at less than one third of the growth. So yes, we are growing, but we are not growing as fast as we would grow in a free trade world. Plus, geopolitics <laughs> impact how trade routes evolve. Now I'm coming to a complex slide and it's my second, last slide, but I want to share with you a few of these trade routes. There are trade routes that will go massively down. Obviously, the trade route between Russia and EU goes down by more than 200 billion euros, which is due to all the energy sanctions we see here. But we see also a trade route between China and US going down. And obviously, we see also that the Brexit has proven not very useful for the UK. Then, you have trade routes that grow, the yellowish ones. Grow, but grow slowly, underproportionally. And the most interesting thing is that all the really strong trade routes are in the global south. This is the picture of the future, where you see that one trillion dollar additional trade is emanating from Southeast Asia. You see that India is playing an important role, but you also see that the North Atlantic trade is booming considerably. And you could flatly say that the Europeans are replacing Russian pipeline gas by North American LNG. I think this is oversimplified, but you see a shift of trade going on. And looking at the winners next to Southeast Asia, look at where Mexico stands. Mexico is the big winner of nearshoring and friendshoring in this world. So let me conclude before I move to the panel. What do we see for corporate leaders? We see five no regret moves. First, make sure that you diversify your supply chains. The word I hear most in boardrooms currently is China plus one or China plus two. 
which means what is the alternative to China, both as a market and as a supply chain. Second, enhance your navigation ability in a world of price volatility and inflation. Third, prepare your organization to work in different worlds. Do you need an organization for China and one organization for India and one for Europe? The time where one headquarter was running the world is definitely over. Fourth, look at turbocharging, turbocharging risk and cybersecurity. And last but not least, build the geopolitical muscle in the corporate boardroom. So in order to further develop this geopolitical muscle, I'm very pleased to join this great panel uh, who, with whom I'll have the pleasure to discuss over the next hour um, the impact of geopolitics and global trade on the corporate boardrooms. So I'll start with a brief introduction and then we'll go with the statements. So I'm joined by Penny next to me, who is with the Atlantic Council. Penny, you were before that 10 years at UPS, taking care of international affairs, before that at Citicorp, and before in the US administration. We talked a lot about your perspective on how will trade change. I think you have a very also interesting perspective on the two last US administration. And we look forward to hearing you view which one was more beneficial <laughs> for trade. Um, Tehu, you have been uh, Korea's Minister of Trade in the early 2010s. Uh, you have been active in the actively promoting trade. You have also been professor and dean at the Korean National University, and you are uh, now advising companies in this all trade environment. Nicolas, you are with Total Energy. You started also in the French administration and then joined Total Energy 22 years ago. You are now uh, president of the whole production and exploration activities. You have been in many different countries, uh, working in places like Nigeria, Myanmar, Qatar, and we discussed also in our preparation that you see a big power of your business and your industry to really look at the development and building bridges going forward. And Jay, you have been at the Navy, you have been diplomat in places like Pakistan and many other places, uh, and you have then moved to consulting and you are now heading Veracity Worldwide, which is a global geopolitical consultancy and risk consultancy, and we have also the pleasure to work together on some instances. So this is the group, and let me go maybe in the order of the panel we have here with uh, the perspectives that this group has on geopolitics and trade. And so I'd like to invite Nicolas uh, for the first statement on how you see it from an extractive industry perspective, which I think is the one of the industries that, if there's an industry that already has a good geopolitical muscle, it's definitely the extractive industry. But I think there are many other industries that can learn from you. Over to you. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, first, uh, let me say it's a pleasure to join this panel and to share a few comments on how a company like Total Energy is managing uh, geopolitical risks, international risk. Uh, and I'm going to start with that, and after I want to make a, a few comments on how we see some opportunities in uh, international trade and investment, and, and finish with a few comments on energy transitions in, in, in all this. So Total Energy, you know, is a French company, so we are born 100 years ago in, in a country where there is virtually no oil and gas resource. So from the very beginning, we had to go abroad, you know, work in, uh, in different countries and learn how to manage geopolitical risk. Uh, and you know, when thinking about how we do that, uh, I came up with uh, five or six key principles. The first one is about uh, compliance with our values. Uh, and our first core value is the security and the safety of our people. And it's impossible for a company to send a lot of people abroad in challenging environment if you know you don't ensure their safety and their security. So we have golden rules, we have a safety framework, uh, we learn from experience, and, and this we apply everywhere. Similarly, 
One key principle for us to navigate into those, those risks is to always stick to our compliance principles and ethics principles, no matter what is the country, what is the, what is the context. And obviously, to comply with international sanctions when they apply to our activities. So that's principle number one, compliance with our values. Number two, it's pretty obvious, is diversification. Uh, so the company is working in uh, 130 countries. We, you know, we like to diversify the way we allocate our capital. Uh, we've set a principle for ourselves that uh, we don't allocate more than 10% of our total capital employee in one single country. For upstream investments, our upstream investments, uh, they are scattered between uh, the Americas, the Middle East, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, I think the biggest area for us is the uh, Middle East and North Africa, which is a bit less than 30% of our total production. So we diversify. Similarly, when doing our transition and investing in integrated power and renewables, uh, we make sure that we also diversify the allocation of the capital and we also diversify investments between deregulated markets and regulated markets. The third principle is we like the exposure to liquid markets. Uh, of course, oil, the oil market is a liquid market. When you produce oil, you know the oil goes on a tanker and can be supplied to any country in the world. For gas, it's a bit more complicated because gas relies on heavy uh, transportation infrastructure. For gas, we focus a lot of our investment in liquefied natural gas which offers this flexibility uh, on, on, on this exposure to a liquid market. You know, for liquefied natural gas, you can redirect the production from one country to another. The first one is about supply chain resilience. Uh, in this moving world that is getting more and more fragmented, uh, we are careful to continue working with a wide array of contractors from different locations. And of course, the geographical footprint of the company helps us to do that. Uh, we tend also you know, to develop long-term frame agreements with our contractors to provide visibility and uh, to provide security of supply in a way to, to both sides. The next one is about uh, cost discipline uh, and financial strength. Uh, we are in our industry exposed to uh, high volatility, volatility of prices. You know, the oil price can go up and down from $20 to $100. So this we don't control, we accept we don't control that. But what we control is our cost. Uh, and our motto is to produce low-cost energy, which is a key factor for us of resilience and strength. And the strength of the balance sheet, of course, is also key for a company like Total Energy to weather crisis, which can have a pretty significant or severe impact at times. And the last principle is, uh, it's not a principle, in fact, it's a, it's a principle of action, is crisis anticipation and preparation. So we spend quite a bit of time uh, on uh, identifying and mapping our risks, uh, making sure we have the right uh, mitigations in place, uh, carrying out crisis management exercise based on a number of scenarios. And this is what allowed us, in fact, to weather a number of the recent crises. If I take, for example, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we never stopped production in any of our operational sites during the entire crisis. But this is due, basically, to practice on, a, uh, on, on, on anticipation and on, on preparation. The second comment I want to make is um, that private investment uh, through long-term partnerships contributes to build bridges uh, between companies, between countries. And those bridges, they can, not always, but they can survive a geopolitical crisis. So what we are doing here, for instance, in the UAE, where we have a partnership that we built with ADNOC for 80 years now, uh, where people uh, know each other, where we shared a lot of experience, where we, of course, invested in Abu Dhabi, but also teamed 
uh, with ad hoc to invest together abroad. Uh, this type of bridge or this type of link is very solid, and that's what we try to develop to make sure that our activities are resilient. We have similar partnerships in uh, many countries across uh, Africa, across Americas, across uh, the Middle East and uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, we also contribute to or participate or like to participate in cross-border investments. Uh, a good example of that is a, a project called Dolphin, uh, the gas pipeline between Qatar and the UAE, which started 15 years ago. Gas has continued to flow uh, uninterrupted during uh, 50 years. Uh, uh, despite uh, ups and downs. I would say our resilience also, or the, the one way that we try, we use to, to increase our resilience uh, is uh, integration. Uh, in oil and gas, we not only produce oil and gas, but we also supply oil and gas to the people. Uh, you take uh, the example of Africa, for instance, in almost all African countries, we have a substantial distribution network, which for us uh, is a factor of uh, robustness because it means we not only produce and export energy, but we also supply energy to the people. And when you bring something to the people, basically, they generally support your activities in a better manner. So my last comment, uh, I'm watching the time, is uh, that in this uh, changing uh, global trade pattern, one key factor is uh, the energy transition and the, the need to um, address uh, climate change. In Total Energy, we believe that our role, our mission, is to provide more energy with less emissions. Why more energy? Because there is a growing population uh, needed uh, more, more energy, but uh, this more energy we want to supply it in a manner that is safer, that makes energy available, affordable to the people. Uh, and when I was talking about controlling the cost and, you know, of our activity, it's also a way to make energy supply affordable to the people. Less emissions, I don't need to explain, because, of course, uh, we need to produce uh, energy uh, with, uh, while reducing cons the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, particularly for ourselves, the greenhouse gas emissions related to our activities, so what we call our scope one and two emissions. So, by doing this, uh, we are working not on our own, but we are working in partnerships uh, with uh, national oil companies in the countries in which we operate. It's the case here uh, with ADNOC, for instance, where we cooperate on uh, identification and uh, uh, elimination of uh, methane emissions from, uh, from our operations. We like also to develop multi-energy projects. Uh, we have a large project, uh, multi-energy project in Iraq that we started recently, where we develop an oil production, but we also gather and process natural gas for local power generation. And we built a, a large scale one gigawatt uh, solar power generation plant to supply the local communities in, in Basra area. So typically for us, this kind of multi-energy project is a way to contribute to the transition in a manner that is positive for the countries in which we operate. And it's also a way for us to manage risk and to diversify what, what we are doing. Well, I'm going to, st to stop there and uh, just to say that, uh, of course, uh, Geopolitical risk and uh, the risk associated with our investment is a, a key parameter in all the investment decision making in the company and in the way we uh, endorse uh, or decide to launch projects. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nicolas. And I think the point which is also interesting is to see this role, as you said, building bridges and also investing in local communities huh, is, is, I think, a very important part of avoiding risk, not also from a corporate point of view, but from a societal point of view. Thank you. So, uh, Penny, you, uh, we discussed about the U.S. I think the U.S. has been one of the key uh, drivers and shapers of global trades. In 1945, has been at the beginning of uh, 44, beginning of the Bretton Woods uh, Conference and bringing the world together, trying to define some rules of the game. 
Now, lately, we have seen that these rules of the game have changed or are changing. Um, you have been looking at that for many years from different vantage points, from corporate, from government. So what's your view on geopolitics and trade and what can be done today, also in the light of what will happen next year? Great. Well, thank you. So I believe trade is a force for good. And I'm so pleased to be here today because I can actually say the word trade, which you can't really say in Washington, D.C. <laughs> at the moment. Everything supply chains, economic security, other issues, but we don't really talk about trade. Earlier today, we saw some fantastic slides and some presentations about how trade has contributed to global wealth creation. And we've also seen how trade has been impactful at helping poverty decline globally because the lowest 25% of our populations are the ones that are most impacted by the regressive trade policies like tariffs and non-tariff barriers that go into effect. When COVID-19 hit, people suddenly had to grapple with the fact that everything wasn't available instantaneously. I know I had to deal with my kids who didn't understand why they couldn't get exactly what they wanted exactly at that moment because of the overwhelming but slightly odd demands we all had during that period. Trade and supply chains were actually quite resilient during COVID-19. And while we may not have been able to get the hair clippers we needed or the Peloton machines or some of the other things that all of us wanted when we were at home making bread and trying to do jobs and educate children at the same time, supply chains generally adjusted because international trade and the rules generally worked. And I think that that is not understood or appreciated enough by folks. What people have focused on are some of the export controls and export restrictions that went into place, some of the port issues that arose, the hard infrastructure issues that arose because it is people that are behind the movement of goods. And when people can't get to their jobs because of COVID, it does bollocks up things a little bit. And then there was also, in some cases, really extreme demand for things that we had to retool uh, factories and other things to do. So when I think about the geopolitics and when I look forward, I think what impacts uh, is really coming into the fore is the lack of trust that developed coming out of this. So while trade moved relatively well, there was some distrust that came up, building on what had been developing over time uh, already, but it really, I think, came to the fore coming out of COVID-19. And you can particularly see that around the vaccine issue, particularly in the global south. So um, that's resulted in a whole lot of supply chain resilience groups being developed and a whole lot of other things that are going on. But that current geopolitical situation and the tensions that are there between some of the big countries is really leading to these debates, as you've pointed out, about deglobalization, reglobalization, or, or maybe everything is just a lot of hot air that we're, there, we're talking about and nothing's really changing. I think trade is like water. It finds its way around the rocks and the river, but there are ways to control, guide, sometimes dam water, but as long as there is demand or gravity, the water will continue to flow. And what we're seeing now is governments trying to control the flows of trade in ways that I think um, were pointed out earlier, using export controls, using sanctions, using indirect means, using investment, outbound investment regimes and other regimes. All of that is coming to the fore to try to control where we are today. So. As a result, I think trade is becoming more regional, both physically and cultural. And so let me turn now a bit to where we are in the US. So there was a great piece last week. Uh, it was a comedy skit uh, on a show in the United States called Saturday Night Live. And it was a skit about George Washington trying to rally the troops to fight for life, liberty, and the pursuit of the Americans' ability to use their own series of weights and measures. And it went through a whole discussion about how the uh, Americans wanted to use kind of irrational, slightly random weights and measures, whether it be Fahrenheit, whether it be pounds, whether it be tons, whether it be any of the measures we use in the United States. 
And it pointed out how we wanted to be able to do exactly what we wanted to do, and even though it wasn't 100% rational, that was what our goal was. And I think sometimes when I look at our trade policy, it reminds me of how Americans have adopted our series of weights and measures in the United States. It's not always in our best interest, but by gosh, we're going to do it. So Jake Sullivan recently published a piece in Foreign Affairs talking about our current U.S. foreign policy and where we're going to reestablish U.S. leadership. But he didn't mention trade once in the piece. Um, if you look at other U.S. government publications, they've pretty much stopped mentioning exports as well. So for the Biden administration, global leadership is back, and they really are trying to rebuild friendships with people around the world. But they're also trying to grow the U.S. economy, as they say, from the middle out and the bottom up. And that seems to be taking precedent in terms of how they're approaching our international economic relations. So they're trying to develop a whole series of new economic tools that will help them to deepen these relationships with countries but not sacrifice the middle class. So we th see things like IPEF. This week they're doing the America's Leaders Summit, all of which are tools that are generally not binding, do not fall under any kind of enforcement mechanism, and frankly are, may not be durable if the administration changes in a year's time. So very innovative, trying to be very creative, but at the end of the day, unclear how durable these new things they're developing are going to be. The WTO has been largely ignored and neglected by the administration, and we can see that where it is. That may be the best case scenario for the WTO at the moment, is that um, as we, we look forward, and as we also look forward, there's a heavy focus on manufacturing, and you had the chart on, good, uh, on goods, but services is a huge part of the U.S. economy, and services does continue to grow, but the administration made some kind of surprising announcements last week about digital trade that I think were quite um, confusing, given, I think, um, where the U.S. is on digital trade. So people are asking, will a Biden 2.0 be more open to trade? Um, I'm, I'm not convinced. If you look at Biden's record as a senator and his voting record, uh, you will see that he's got a very mixed record with regards to trade. And I know a lot of people are pinning hopes that maybe Biden, if he stays on or wins re-election, will do something ambitious. I just don't, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's where we're going. And I think that where we are today is probably the best case scenario for the U.S. with regards to trade. Let me conclude with um, companies. Um, so I think what became also really clear out of this is that companies um, didn't know where all their risk were. And risk, um, generally companies, you can scenario plan, risk are generally not what the last crisis was. Uh, it's something new, usually something that surprises you, and while it might occasionally be a black swan, what hits you is usually something that's within your control. So supply chains were an issue, not necessarily because of other things, but because um, uh, it didn't really rise to the C-suite in the past. So, so being able and sitting down and doing creative scenario planning, um, looking at some of the issues in a much more uh, thoughtful way, I think are really important for companies, and I know others on this panel will be discussing some of the specifics around how to do that moving forward. So with that, I could like to conclude. Thank you, Nicholas, for the time. And thank you all in the audience. I know we're post-lunch. It's always the hardest slot to have at a conference. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Penny. And uh, we'll try to be as uh, interesting and entertaining as possible <laughs> to overcome post-lunch uh, inertia. Um, uh, I think just on this last point, which you mentioned, it's interesting. I met the one with the CEO, and maybe he has a very focused view of the world. But he said to me, you know, it's interesting because I have three new topics on my agenda in the last 10 years. So 10 years ago, digital appeared on my agenda. Five years ago, sustainability appeared on my agenda. And geopolitics appeared on my agenda on February 24th of last year. Uh, which I found interesting that this is kind of a five-year increment. And, he, and, and that's also something which we see that this kind of geopolitical muscle needs to be developed. 
So let me now turn uh, to Theo. Thank you very much for coming over from Seoul and give us the perspective of trade. You have been very much engaged in global trade negotiations, uh, both on an incentive perspective, also on a protecting perspective. Um, you have been, as I said, uh, the Minister uh, for Trade in Korea, and you have a very interesting perspective on the future trade regimes. So please, over to you. Well, thank you, Nikolaus. Uh, actually, I'm the only one who doesn't know much about business, <laughs> uh, even though I'm advising our clients about the geopolitics, you know, and some legislation introduced by United States and EU, but I'm not really in the you know, area of business. So bear that in mind. Uh, uh, this, this afternoon, I want to share some of my thoughts uh, on the um, evolving landscape uh, of the world uh, trade environment. And uh, as we all know very well, we all talk about this in, uh, in the first session and second session, the global trade environment has been undergoing unprecedented uh, transformation. And as a trade economist, uh, I believe the most fundamental change is the increasing prevalence of negative views toward uh, globalization and free trade among the general public. There is a widespread perception uh, in many countries that domestic industries and laborers have suffered from uh, domestic companies' overseas investment and excessive imports from uh, abroad, uh, since they think that, that these have uh, caused a uh, huge unemployment rate and also growing income uh, inequality. Unfortunately, uh, politicians uh, have strategically promoted this negative sentiment on globalization and free trade to capitalize on the psychological state of low income voters, uh, predominantly uh, composed of workers, for their advantages in the election. Indeed, uh, this has led to protectionist policies in many countries that prioritize domestic production over corporate overseas investment and imports from a uh, uh, foreign country. Another critical impact, uh, uh, another critical aspect impacting the world trade environment, we all talk about this, is the strategic competition between the US and China. Following the imposition of extra tariffs on imports uh, from China by former President Trump, US-China uh, disputes have uh, broadened the scope of national security to include economic and technology areas. The US considers steel and aluminum even crucial element in its national security and is actively engaging in securing its dominant uh, position in strategically advanced technology sectors such as semiconductor, electric vehicles, EV batteries and AI and so on. In addition, the global companies, uh, we all talk about this uh, now, have experienced real challenges uh, stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic and the war between Russia and Ukraine, and they recognize the imperative need to restructure their uh, supply chain. At the same time, uh, major countries are actively promoting initiatives related to various social and environmental objectives, including uh, enhancing labor, and human rights, and uh, reducing carbon emission, and uh, protecting the environment. Let me now provide some uh, examples of major countries' policy measures. The US has introduced the uh, Chips and Science Act, uh, allow allocating $52 billion in subsidies to the semiconductor sector. The EU has also introduced the EU Chips Act, which uh, provides substantial amount of subsidies to increase the global market share of its semiconductor. It is crucial to notice that countries previously critical of China for providing heavy government subsidies to specific sectors now give themselves industrial subsidies to promote their domestic uh, industries. Of course, China continues to provide government subsidies to key advanced technology sectors. This means that uh, industrial policies may be uh, revived triggering unfair trade activities among major countries. The U.S. restricts exports of semiconductor and semiconductor equipment to China, which is you know, hugely affecting the Korean companies, which are operating in China. Samsung and SK Hynix are, are producing semiconductor in China. 
The U.S. also introduced, uh, we, we in Korea we call IRA, but now it's like IRA, uh, IRA uh, which is Infl Inflation Reduction Act, which includes provisions, uh, uh, provisions discriminating uh, against uh, electric vehicles assembled outside North America. And uh, EVs equipped with batteries manufactured with parts or minerals from the so-called foreign countries of concern, which may include uh, China. At the same time, uh, leading nations worldwide have advocated uh, for policies to establish stable supply chain, particularly for critical raw materials. For example, the United States is uh, endeavoring to establish a critical minerals club with the EU through the uh, Trade and Technology Council, another club uh, with the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, member states. Also, EU uh, has introduced Critical Raw Material Act to limit its dependence on a single country for critical raw material to a maximum of 65%. As we can see, major countries are utilizing subsidies, trade, and investment measures to achieve uh, their national objectives in various areas, including national security, the economy, technology, society, and more. However, some of these measures may violate the multilateral trade norms of the WTO, such as the subsidies agreement and the principles of most favored nation and national treatment. Certain measures included in the US IRA are a good examples of these violations. Nonetheless, the world trade governance, particularly the multilateral trading system of the WTO, is not effectively addressing these issues. As we all know, WTO dispute settlement system remains incomplete because there's no judges at the appellate body since the end of 2019, and appointing the appellate body judges has been unsuccessful. So even if a WTO member wins a dispute, through the panel investigation, the final legal result will be pending until the appellate body, which currently has no judges, uh, can make a ruling. Therefore, it would be meaningless to accuse any members for their violation of the WTO norms and principles for the time being. So we now find ourselves in a world where major nations are adopting various unilateral actions focusing on their domestic political agenda to achieve economic as well as non-economic uh, objectives. The negative consequences of these unilateral actions on the world trade will progressively escalate. If this trend uh, continues, world trade order will remain uh, fragmented, increasing uncertainty in the global trade environment. Under these circumstances, it will be practically impossible for the whole WTO members to discuss sensitive issues. However, doing nothing would not be a, a desirable option either. So we should note that the WTO, member, uh, WTO allows member states to take unilateral actions if fair and non-discriminatory implement, implementation of these actions is guaranteed. Considering all this, it would be crucial for countries with similar interests and positions to engage in uh, transparent and unbiased discussions on uh, various issues, including new commercial uh, rules, uh, and come up with uh, uh, agreements. Of course, these agreements should be open to non-participating countries that may wish to accede later. Many trade experts uh, consider uh, these so-called open plurilateral agreements as the second best option for addressing important issues at the WTO. So in conclusion, I would like to note that serious efforts from major uh, uh, trading nations are urgently needed to respond to this uh, crisis situation uh, in the world trade environment and mitigate uncertainties in the global trade environment. Thank you very much. This is all. Thank you, Tayo. And I think it's, it's real that we, as you said, you speak about the crisis environment. I think the fact that WTO is not active anymore, creates a vacuum, which we also see obviously in a kind of a multipolar world where mm -hmm. I think the clear institutions that used to steer that global economy are have been massively weakened. Yeah. Yes. So let me move to Jay. Uh, you're working with many, many corporates around the world, providing them 
geopolitical advice in every country of this world, almost. <laughs> About uh, 150. Uh, 150. Um, so what's your view on the current state of geopolitics and trade? Well, it's a, a privilege to be here, and I want to first say thank you very much to the organizers, both of our panel, but of course of the broader conference. Um, I'll attempt in, in my time to synthesize some of the conversations we're having with corporate leaders and investors that are very much engaged in, in trade, very much engaged in decisions around capital financial flows, and what uh, some of the things they're thinking about when it comes to the topics that we've been discussing here. These are traders, these are investors. So first and foremost, I would say, uh, taking your framework, Nicholas, of turbocharging risk management. They are seeking to uh, build a taxonomy, to map the various risks that they face. And financial firms have done this uh, over the course of the last 25 years increasingly well, in part due to regulatory requirements that have been placed on them. Non-financial institutions are relatively new at this. And when they think about risk mapping, typically they think about operational risk, they think about tax-related risk, uh, they think about jurisdiction-related risk, they don't think about geopolitical risk. And so, as you say, uh, Nicholas, this is very new on the agenda. And so what we've been uh, encouraging our clients to do is to very much identify where they have uh, exposure in this respect. But that's not the only step you can take when it comes to, to risk. You have to prioritize your risks. You have to dimensionalize what you think might come to pass and what you need to focus on. And there are all kinds of ways you could dimensionalize risk. Obviously, whether it's going to uh, come into your life, whether there's a likelihood or a probability of that risk occurring, and also what its impact will be. And in the upper right, you can start to then focus on what the things are that you should begin to work on. Um, you should definitely uh, build crisis management capabilities around those risks in the event that you have to deal with them. And this is to your point, Penny. Many companies may have something on the table, something on the shelf, but they don't actually do the work of testing themselves. And you mentioned this point also, Nicola, of really exercising their capabilities through simulations around specific scenarios. And finally, they have to be real with themselves to know where their gaps are to be able to build the capabilities that are required in the event these risks actually were to come to pass. So what risks are we talking about? From a geopolitical perspective, we really uh, break this down into three different categories. The three categories are country level or even sub-country level risk. The second is regional risk or regional flashpoints. And the third are some macro global trends that are very difficult to get your head around, but which are extremely important to plan for, especially if you're in the business of doing strategy. So businesses are probably best when it comes to geopolitical risk around country level topics or sub country level topics. Why is that? Well, if you're a total, you're going into a, a country, you know you need to engage with the political leadership you know you need to know about the political opposition. You know you need to know about the regulatory environment. You know you need to know about what policy changes might be coming down the line. You know you need to understand the stakeholder groups that could affect your position and your social license to operate. So I would say, historically, of all of the risks that might be identified, country-level risks are something that companies can do quite well through government relations capabilities, through communications capabilities, and uh, just as a matter of, of, of requirement for going into a new environment or maintaining relationships with local partners. Um, all of those factors I identified at the beginning, knowing your risks, prioritizing them, building crisis management capabilities, testing them, they all very much are important to do in the country level, but I would say many of our non-financial clients actually do this quite well, increasingly well, especially in fields like energy, fields like mining, fields like telecommunications, advanced industries such as semiconductors, renewables. These are all sectors where companies face real risk at the country level, but they identify it and they're working on it. 
the two additional types of geopolitical risk that are much more difficult to, to work on are the regional flashpoints and the kind of global longer term trends. There's been discussion over the course of our panel and previous panels, and I, I know over the course of the next couple of days around the major flashpoints uh, around the world today. But the three that our clients are most concerned about relate to the war in Ukraine, relate to instability and now open conflict in the Middle East, and relate to potential for uh, the worsening of relationships between not just the United States and China, but broadly speaking, the West and the emerging uh, relationships that China is building with uh, its closest partners. Each one of these has elements of instability, yet each one of these is very difficult to predict. And so you have to, as you're thinking about geopolitical risk around regional flashpoints or these types of um, uh, potential conflict scenarios, you have to bound your thinking around specific assumptions and around what will impact your business. And this is very difficult to do, and it requires, frankly, really uh, difficult conversations about what the business impact will be, not just for your company, but for your suppliers and your sub-suppliers and your partners and others that might be affected through second and third order impact of these situations uh, unraveling, unraveling further. And in the case of Ukraine, in the case of the Middle East, in the case of the relationships between the United States and G7, let's say, China and other countries working together with China, there is some degree of ambiguity, and that ambiguity needs to be identified and worked through. The third category, and I'll be brief, but I could spend lots of time on this category because it's incredibly interesting. It's around where is our world going? So if these flashpoints were to come to pass, or if they were to have specific types of impact on companies, what does this mean for the future of our world? And we really see five different um, macro trends happening as a result of the way our world is structured today. Some of which are very much aligned with what you talked about, uh, Nicholas, in your presentation, and some are maybe additive to what you were, were saying. But our first relates to domestic instability that's resulting from some of this geopolitical tension. And really questions around liberalism versus populism, or liberalism versus a more autocratic type of, of government. How do you best uh, how do you best understand the demands of your population, changing nature of populations, especially youth populations, underrepresented populations, and how do you ensure that you have the means by which to address those issues and provide a, a, a valve for those to be, to be uh, vocalized? Many countries are facing difficulties around this, uh, not the least of which is our country, and Penny alluded to some of the, the, uh, the factors related to that. But there is a degree of nihilism among the, the youth population of the United States where they just want to burn the house down. There is a degree of uh, just lack of engagement where uh, in a participatory democracy, that's in fact very dangerous. And we see this as a growing trend throughout, uh, especially the West and parts of East Asia. Second major uh, uh, macro trend is around the energy transition. And of course, you focus on this every day, Nicola. But there's so much discussion. If we're, as we're moving towards a green economy, how are we going to manage where we are, getting from where we are now to where we need to be? And what does that mean for our mix in terms of oil and gas? What does that mean for our mix in terms of renewables? How are we going to get access to critical minerals to fuel battery production, electric vehicle production, semiconductor production, and all the trade-related implications related to that, the protectionist instincts that are increasingly paramount. That's a macro trend. The third relates to the post-World War II uh, security order, which is increasingly being questioned, if not actively undermined. And this also relates to the economic security of the post-World War II order. Nicholas, you mentioned the, the Bretton Woods system which of course now is also being called into question, not just by those who would be against it, but, that, but, but by those who would uh, ignore it, frankly, not seek, to, not seek to engage in that respect. And the, the fifth, and we can talk about this maybe on the sidelines, but it's maybe on the minds of many people here, and that's the formation of, of blocks. This concept of, of, of blocks is, is still very much 
um, being developed. It's, it's, it's not well formed. But there are blocks ideologically, there are blocks in terms of interests, and there are blocks in terms of security and economic relationships. And um, a major macro uh, trend as far as we're concerned, that these blocks are being increasingly well-defined, they're increasingly being reified, and they're increasingly being used to define one group against another group. How you make sense of all this in terms of your risk management and your ability to scenario plan and your ability to understand how this could impact your business is incredibly important and something we spend a lot of time on with our clients. I'll stop there out of interest of time, but um, I, I hope that that's offered some food for thought. If you're out there uh, representing a business or if you're in government thinking about how you can better work with your, your business colleagues. Well, thank you, Jay. And I think the blocks refer back to this multipolar competition we have uh, discussed earlier. And I think I clearly see this development as well going and shaping also how corporations work. So we'll do a quick uh, Q&A here in the group before we open to the room. And maybe, Nicola, one question. We heard a lot about uh, scenario planning, about thinking about the future, about being prepared. And of course, you work in highly geopolitically shifting environment. So, I don't know, would you have a quick view of two, three key learnings you have gathered by reacting to geopolitical shifts in the past? Well, I would say the first learning is that the risk generally materializes when you, or where you don't expect it. Um, you know, I think three years ago, I'm not sure we had, for instance, large pandemics in our... And we're doing exactly what Jay described, you know, this uh, risk mapping uh, with likelihood, severity, etc. I don't think we had a major pandemic in our risk uh, mapping. Uh, I don't think we expected what happened in Russia. I'm not sure we expected what happened in uh, Israel and Gaza. So the risk materialized where we don't expect it. I think the second thing we learned for sure is that, you know, our... Our principle to limit the capital allocation in one country is a good principle. Uh, and we've learned it the hard way. Um, in Russia. And uh, I think the third uh, thing we've learned, uh, and certainly that we still need to improve, but you know, we are learning, is, is the importance of communication and explaining what we are doing and why we are doing it. Very good, thank you. So, Benny, you alluded already to uh, Biden 2.0. Now I have to ask the question, uh, what's your view on trade if someone else's wins this election? <laughs> so, I think in general, what I would say is, is that um, where we are at the moment on trade, and I think it's a little like the climate change issue. I mean, the climate has changed, and the best we can do at this point on climate is to keep what we have today. If we stop, it's, it's almost impossible to go back to the climate all of us had as children. And I think the same is true on trade. I look at the trade environment, both with Biden and with um, potential Trump, as uh, what we have today may be uh, the best we can hope for, uh, particularly for those that are adherents to more traditional trade uh, and trade instruments. Um, I think both may look at a second term as uh, opportunities to continue on the trajectories they've been on. Uh, Trump has already talked about a 10%, potentially 35% flat tariff, depending on whether you're with a free trade uh, partner or not. Um, Biden has talked about several other things, I think, and having talked to the two individuals being rumored by both to be the USTR and a second administration for both. I, I think that it's uh, where we are today and where we may be um, is something we need to watch. If I could, one thing I wanted to just follow up on super quickly is um, I think one thing that's really important coming out of the conversation that we've had is how important transparency has become yeah. in companies. And maybe digitalization will help with this, but going to the risk point, I think that many people are aware of, but your carbon footprint, the human rights of your supply chain, um, 
and, and a lot of other issues, um, transparency around your, your operations has become incredibly important and is incredibly hard to do. So that's something that digitalization may provide some opportunities for in the future, but I see that as something companies will continually need to plan for moving forward. Great, thank you very much, Penny. So we have another five minutes and like to open uh, to the audience for Q and A's. Uh, we have here a very diverse panel. We have one question here. Maybe we can get the mic to the lady. Thank you for your very exciting panel. My name is Mario Zibiloa, and uh, I have a question especially for Professor Lang, but any of you can answer. You mentioned the, um, uh, the multipolar world, and uh, as we know, the BRICS had their geopolitical moment uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, they account for that what we say we hear 40% of the world GDP. So, um, do you consider the BRICS and the new doors they have been opening, like a common currency, and uh, you know, uh, in the uh, a new uh, world financial architecture, all these things? Do you consider that a threat, or this is a very positive development for trade? Uh, and the second question is. What could become a danger coming from the BRICS? Thank you. So, yeah, um, I'll take another two questions and then we uh, try to answer. There's a second question here, a third one here, and then we'll try Here's to answer. A question to uh, the managing director of Total. Uh, how do you anticipate the decline of oil consumption because of electric engines? and because of a green economy, and how will it affect the oil prices? Okay, thank you. That's the second question. Nicolas, there was a third question, and then we'll start answering, just trying to manage time. Can we have the mic in the middle for the gentleman? Thank you very much for this exciting pa panel. I'm speaking from the viewpoint of a uh, former and current member of uh, um, several boards of uh, large multinational companies. And I wanted to uh, um, ask you whether we, you shared this observation that I'm going to make and react uh, on it. Probably one of the most striking things when it comes to uh, strategic risks in the very past years has been the realization by very large multinational companies that uh, they were not um, uh, global companies opening, uh, working globally and freely, but they were belonging to a nationality. Mm -hmm. They, uh, all Western companies suddenly had to uh, give up their activities in Russia, for instance, and they realized that they have to uh, abide to a certain camp. Of course, they are making the same assessment with China mm -hmm. and other areas of threat, and they are taking uh, they are taking consequences out of the situation in reshaping supply chains, the way they work, and making themselves more immune to those political risks, okay. as you have advised. Now. Are they not, by doing that, sort of creating a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy and paving the way for possible increase of the likelihood of conflicts by reducing, in the very concrete way, through the way they operate, the increasing the possibilities of a conflict? Okay, thank you very much. So we'll try to answer every question in one minute to keep time. So Nicola, do you want to take the question on uh, energy transition and oil production? Yes, bon, the, de the decline in, uh, in oil consumption, we, bon, we don't have a crystal ball on total energy, but we, we expect, you know, the oil uh, demand to reach its peak during this current decade. And then to decline, uh, and to decline to a level, you know, to, to, be, to be net zero uh, by 2050, uh, uh, the oil uh, demand, uh, you know, could be let's say, 20-25% of what it is today. There will still be an oil demand because, you know, there are some products that you cannot substitute, actually, yeah? particularly for petrochemicals. But then, hence, you know, the need for 
compensation of this residual demand. The big uncertainty is on the pace of the decline, uh, on how fast it's going to be. And regarding the question on oil price impact of all this, uh, what's important to, to have in mind is that uh, an oil field is not producing flat over time. So there is a natural decline of the production, which is 4 to 5% per year. So it means that if you stop investing in new oil projects in 10 years from now, the production will have decreased by 40%. Uh, so basically, the price, the oil price, but in order to keep it under control or at an acceptable level, and it's a question of affordability of energy, companies need to continue investing in new development to offset the decline, or at least to offset the decline partly, you know, uh, when, when, when the demand is, uh, is, is decreasing. Uh, voilà, I hope it addresses the question. Very good. Thank you. But there was a question about by reshaping supply chains, are we, inc and by segregating supply chain, are we increasing the risk of a conflict? Penny, 30 seconds, Tyro, 30 seconds. What's your view? Uh, so I think the question was also about nationalism and yeah. uh, U.S. companies reacting, you know, quickly on the Russia situation by pulling out. I think, in short, I would say yes. When I read Jake Sullivan's foreign affairs piece, uh, there's things in there. They don't mention the word trade, but there's other things in there that, to me, look like uh, companies are becoming part of the industrial national security strategy of the United States in a way that. I think limits freedoms in some ways, and I do think it's something companies need to look at uh, very, very carefully. Thank you, Theo. Joe's well, comment. Uh, the companies are very quick in responding to this kind of restrictions, and uh, many Korean companies are investing uh, to have a, a stable supply chain into uh, resource-rich countries like mm -hmm. Canada, Australia. There are lots of investment is being made by Korean companies mm -hmm. to. You know, to establish supply, uh, stable supply chain of critical minerals or raw materials. And, and di diversifying. Jay, before I enter on, enter on BRICS, what's, what's your view yeah, on BRICS? Yeah, I would just say there are a couple of additional factors uh, to watch out for. One is the uh, incredible upwelling of interest among stakeholders that were very vocal in the case of uh, the, the Russia pullout. Um, putting a lot of pressure on boards, a lot of pressure on executive teams through various means, direct engagement, social media, and through politicians. And, uh, and this, was, this was facilitated in part by uh, active tracking by uh, many organizations that were looking at how uh, compliant individual companies were with the spirit of the need to, uh, to, to move out of, out of Russia. And in the case of China, um, one can easily imagine something similar happening depending on what the scenario is that we're talking about. The other piece is the sanctions regime that was put in place not just by the, by the United States, but also by the European Union, by the United Kingdom and, and others, um, was sufficiently uh, broadly defined so as to encourage a conservative approach on the part of individual companies so that they could ensure they didn't run afoul of, uh, of sanctions compliance. And um, we can see that although that makes it much more difficult to, uh, to, to control with, if you're the, the sanctioning uh, government, from a company perspective, it makes you um, want to listen to your lawyers who are telling, who are telling you, uh, don't, don't incur any risk when it comes to sanctions. Do the thing that's easiest. And in many cases, it was just to leave the market. Yep. Uh, obviously, in the case of China, it will be a much more difficult conversation. Uh, given how embedded supply chains are, market considerations are, but it's definitely on the minds of corporate leaders. Good, thank you very much. And I think on BRICS, the over, um, our view is that there is a very positive potential in bringing that together. I think if you look uh, both from a trade perspective, from a financial perspective, from an energy perspective, I think BRICS has hugely kind of almost doubled its energy base by the expansion that was decided uh, this year. Uh, and so from our perspective, I think it has much more to win than to be in any case a danger. So yeah, we had had a fast-paced discussion here on global trade. Penny, you said it's a force for good. I think we still believe in that. I would like to thank my panelists for this very broad perspective, for you, for your engagement, and I look further to very interesting discussions over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.